Hey, what's going on guys? It's Mike from Phil Crash Survival. I'm here with Josh Nass from Ham Radio Crash Course. His YouTube channel is a great YouTube channel. It's how I got into ham radio everything. Um, I'm kind of a nerd because I'm Asian and that's what we do. <laughs> um, so I like uh, math, technical things, radios. I'm attracted to them, especially when it comes to preparedness, but I had no idea where to start. The overall objective today is to kind of give you a precursor so you guys could follow Josh's uh, channel because that's how I got started. So I wanna get you turned on to ham radio. I wanna get you turned on to its application and preparedness because that's what all this is about. So welcome Josh, thanks for thank being here. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for having me out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we just did a long podcast, we did a two hour podcast. Yep. Um, what I like about you man is you know how to break things down in layman's terms for simple people to understand. <laughs> I, I want to make it make sense. And oftentimes I find that by breaking things down, it's easier. I do that to myself, right? Just yeah. some kind of internal monologue where something's really complicated, but it's just a series of steps usually to get good at it. Yeah. So that's kind of how I approach all of this. And this has taken a long time, right? To kind of put a simple kit together that's kind of emergency preparedness focused. Yeah. This is, this is a lot of stuff that we talked about in the podcast right. that you would potentially carry because right. you want redundant systems in everyday carry. Right, because there's so many different modes of operation that people use with radio, right? FRS radios that Walmart has. Tons of people have them. CBs are still out there. How, do you, how can you interoperate with those two groups? It's not just ham radio. They're kind of like their own thing, but in, in an emergency, you want all of that capability. Because yeah. if, if you need help and it's only the FRS guys that are listening, then that's what you're gonna use. CB, you know, Jeepers. If you're in an area where there's a lot of overland, a lot of CBs, you wanna be able to work with those, that system. Yeah, what, what I like is the way that you outlined it in the podcast, Josh talked about the reception of information. It's not just necessarily your transmission of your bad circumstance, right. But in a natural or man-made disaster that affects masses, we're talking about wanting to receive information where infrastructure doesn't allow you to receive it. No cell phones, no internet, right. no power, and you could still receive it on ham radios. Right. You, you want, so I always say you want to listen more than you transmit, just at, in general. Whether it's an emergency or not an emergency, you want to understand what's out there. That's what my girlfriend says all the time. Yeah. yeah. You want to keep it in a way that you um, have the capability to receive as much as you can, but then when you need to, be able to transmit. And that's from an emergency standpoint. You know, if you're just running power off your car, you're just burning gas, right? You've got power, you're good. You can talk to your buddies, you can do whatever you want to do as you're driving out to wherever you're going. Go crazy. But when you're in a situation like an emergency, unless you're actively moving traffic, like you are the net controller, which a net controller is someone who says, hey, I'm looking for emergency calls. I'm, I'm, I'm operating on behalf of this first responder group or this emergency preparedness group. Come now, any emergency traffic, right? And you're trying to broker getting the assistance to the people that need it. That's different than if you were just trying to prepare yourself. Mm. If you're preparing yourself, you want to get as much capability to receive possible. And then how do you use that? It may be using different radios at different times to communicate with different groups. Oh, I like, so Josh has a three part series that I was tuned into because it talked about survival and preparedness. Like, look, when, when you think about ham radios and radios period, not a lot of people actually tie it to preparedness because ham radio operators are intermingled together, but there's something secretive about the fact that they're all tied to preparedness and we don't even know it. I didn't realize this until I started investigating your channel right. and then saw that you did a whole video series on what you would do in an extremist situation. One of the things that I got keyed into that I was very interested in is the fact that you have kind of two different task organizations in uh, how you operate with the radio. One, you're the ham radio operator slash subject matter expert and then maybe somebody in your family. And you broke that down really clearly right. with instructions that you laminated inside the box with the radio, right. step-by-step -step yeah. procedures, right? This was, this was the radio from that, this is the one that went in the, call it your wife's uh, go kit, right, for radio. So if you had a situation where you're, you know, you're still within range that this can reach, right, to your wife or, or whomever, or, or buddy or friend, 
how do you make it as simple as possible? Mm. So a laminated card just sits on the body of this thing that explains what you would do in an emergency situation. And it's not necessarily something I came up, although I modified it some, but you can, you, these cards are available online that tell pertinent frequencies that you'd want to know. Um, you'd want to know things like the wilderness protocol, which we talked a little bit about on the podcast and some of the other videos we've done. Basically, it's a way to focus when you listen, particularly when you're on something with a limited battery life, that you're making the most of your time transmitting if you need help, and you're making the most of that battery life when you're receiving. Mm -hmm. So it's the discipline to every three hours starting at 7 a.m., turn your radio on for five minutes and listen. Mm -hmm. And if someone, and if everybody does that, then the people who truly need help will know when to get online, call for help, and we can hopefully help them. Then it saves everybody's battery so we don't have to leave things running all the time, particularly when we're outdoors and we have limited power options for all of these. So that's kind of one, that was the idea of this kit is that you could hand it to anybody, right? And it says, transmit for X amount of time, then you know, wait for, for someone to reply. And you know, sometimes you gotta remind people, let go of the PTT. Yeah, so you can listen. <laughs> so, so you can yeah, hear. that's right. I need help, I'm looking for so-and-so, unkey. Yeah. And wait. So for this, and, and as it applies to your video, is there a breakdown of those instructions that you have? Mm -hmm. um, and is that on your website or is that on your It's on YouTube? the YouTube video for the MCOM series that I did. Yeah. Uh, the first video I believe is, is where we used that radio. And specifically what it came with was the little card that explains what to do and uh, the battery. I, I included a battery bank and the cable to charge this. Uh. Which is one of the, a lot of things that we, I brought here today are mainly inexpensive and cheap using commercial products like the Goal Zero solar system and all that. But this one powers off of USB and almost everything else powers off of AA cells, ah. which in an emergency situation, you're gonna have those. So this this is the one that you recommended for me getting started in ham radio. Right. This is the Bofang UV5R. And this one in particular, I bought for all the guys at Fieldcraft. We're gonna be taking you on this journey. If, probably by the time you see this video, we, are in the process of getting our ham radio license. Good. And so you need, like, it's crazy because we're, this motivates me because I realize it's not that difficult. It's no. not that hard to do. No, no it's not. What's, this, what's the starting process for me getting certified and why? The, the starting process is go take the test. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really the, the, the gate, right? It's a 35 question multiple choice test. They charge like 10 to $15. To do you get retest? Uh, no. You, well, oh, oh wait. I'm sorry. If you fail, if you fail, if you're close, the volunteer examiners may say, "Do you feel like you might want to try again? Yeah. Um, how do you feel? Like bring them Chick Fil A. They, yeah, that's right. You know what I'm saying they they kind of try and feel out how you think you did. Yeah. If you feel confident that you're like, oh, I just missed a dumb one or something like that, then they'll let you uh, pay the fifteen dollars or ten dollars again, and then you retake it. Oh, you slip them a fifteen. I see what <laughs> yeah, happens. Yeah. Then, yeah. <laughs> but the the cool thing about this is. So I mentioned there's three tiers, right? Technician, general, and extra. If you pay the $15 or the $10, whatever fee it is, and it's an administration fee, it's just so that they can keep buying the material they yeah. use and all that stuff. If you pass that technician test, they'll ask you, hey, you wanna take your general test too? Right there. Right, right there. Oh, wow. And you don't have to pay again. You can just take the general. And if you pass that, hey, you feel like taking your extra? And then you can go- All the go all. Yeah, yeah, there's multiple people on the ham radio crash course that did a home run, knocked all three of them out. Wow. That's hard though, that's yeah, yeah. way hard. So technician is not hard to get into. Then there's a big jump to general and then a probably bigger jump to extra. So to, to be able to own, and this I was asked this question and I should have focused on this before, but to be able to own a ham radio, you don't need a license to own one. That's right. To receive information. That's right, so it's a receiver. Um, it's a transceiver as we call it, but that means it has a receiver and a transmitter. You can listen all you want with these radios, just don't hit the button. Uh, now if you wanna transmit, that's where your call sign that's issued to you when you pass the test right. comes in, right? Right, so you would, if you were licensed, you'd key up, announce yourself with your call sign and then whatever it is you're trying to do. You're looking for someone or you just wanna talk or whatever, that's when you would use it that way. So what's the big advantage of a ham radio over let's say a Bass Pro CB radio? That or, you, or, yeah, or, or, or a little FRS. Or walkie talkie, yeah. So they're gonna have more power output, that's five watts. Mm -hmm. The antenna is exchangeable. So you Meaning can you put, pull it off. You could put this antenna on that radio, for instance. Oh. So this one comes off and this one won't come off. 
Right. FRS and GMRS radios are uh, radio locked to one antenna. Uh. And they are channelized, meaning they have like 20 channels or whatever on them. Ham radios are frequency based. So you get hundreds of frequency spaces that you could hop onto to talk to people and not have to worry about dealing with a overcrowded channel situation. Yeah. Same problem exists with CB. Yeah. Out of all these options, you expressed to me which radio was your everyday carry. Yeah. Can you talk to us about which one is your EDC and why? Okay. The FT2DR is my EDC radio because it just has way more features than the standard traditional Baofeng. It is, it does everything the Baofeng does, so it's an analog FM radio, first and foremost. It does APRS, which is a packetized digital um, radio what, uh, positioning system. Mm -hmm. So you're basically gonna take that GPS lat long information, knows your elevation and your heading, and it's gonna send out an RF packet that has that in it. So anyone else with a radio like this will get that information, they can see where you're at, you can even exchange two-way messages. So if you had one, I had one out in the field, I can send you a message you without having right. a key up. Yeah. Right? Just boom, 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 and this is a touch screen. Covert comms, that's what that is. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right. Um, the other thing that this does that the other radios, the other radios don't do, is this is a digital radio as well as an analog. So you can tell it, or you can set it, to when you talk into it, it will encode it into a digital format, which then can be sent out over the RF instead of the analog uh, version of the radio. The advantage to that is kind of twofold. Again, if you had one of these radios, and we were just talking directly to each other over digital, it's gonna go further than the analog radios will get, because the analog radios will have a drop-off effect. Mm. Eventually, it'll just start fizz fizzling out on you, and it's gone. Yeah. Digital, it'll stay good until you get to that hairy edge, and then it's gone, mm. kind of thing. Uh, the other advantage with this is the repeaters that use or interoperate with, with digital, you can run two digital signal conversations simultaneously, um, which is generally for DMR. This is Yesu System Fusion. But the systems, when connected to the repeaters, you can connect via the internet to anywhere in the world that runs a system, like Yesu System Fusion, DMR, DSTAR, every major brand, Yesu, ICOM, uh, not Kenwood, but Kenwood has a DMR radio. They have their own digital data voice modes that they use. That allows you to like, I talk from my radio, uh, it hits a repeater, mm -hmm. it goes to the internet, goes to a different country, yeah. hits that uh, radio station, and then transmits via the radio station to their handset. Yeah, it goes even further than that. So when we were talking on the podcast, we were talking about two rep repeaters linked over the internet. Right? Yeah. Well, in this case, you basically join a chat room kind of for a specific area and anyone on any repeater that is Yesu System Fusion on that chat room can hear you. Oh, so wow. they don't even have to be affiliated repeaters. They're just connected via the internet so you just can talk to anybody. Wow. So there's like a U, uh, there's like America chat room and it's just got like hundreds of people in it. We have a chat room for the Ham Radio Crash Course actually that um, it's called a talk group. And we have interlinked capability that we have um, DMR, DSTAR, and Yesu System Fusion. So any radio you own, if you're on our talk group, yeah. you can talk to anybody on any radio. Oh, wow. So if I wanted to do a Philcraft survival channel exclusive that's a talk chat room, mm -hmm. I could do that through one of the major companies to be able to pour in everybody who's kind of on that. There's a whole lot of work behind the scenes to make it kind of all happen. Yeah. Ham radio is very much a user kind of driven hobby yeah. and it's a lot of tinkering. So it took a while to get to the point that we could have that interoperability between digital modes. Mm -hmm. Can you, at what point are you allowed to, procure is probably the wrong word, but purchase or however you allocate a frequency channel for you and your particular space. Like if I wanted to do a Philcraft emergency management channel mm -hmm. for the local area, mm -hmm. could I do that? Uh, for amateur radio, no. We don't buy frequency spaces. We yeah. share frequency spaces. And they're coordinated beforehand with a, an actual FCC licensed person that does coordination, or I think they're volunteers. But anyway, it's, it's a coordinated effort. It's not something you pay for a slice. Kind of okay, thing. okay. With the talk groups that I'm talking about, that is something that's more on the internet side of the house. Yeah. From a RF standpoint, we're using whatever frequency it is needed to get to that repeater 
or get to that node that's going to get it to the internet. Mm. But again, going back to the survival aspect of this, you don't need the internet to make any of this run. You can still work digital to digital, digital to digital repeater and, and cover the whole propagation space, other repeater with no internet involved. Got it. You said there's two acronyms for groups that do things like preparedness and emergency <laughs> response that major towns and cities have uh, in their areas. What were the names of those and what do they do? Aries and Races, and they have a similar charter, mm -hmm. but they're affiliated with different groups. Aries is the amateur, uh, the ARRL, which is the Amateur Radio Relay League. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like our, um, it's our support mechanism as amateurs for protecting our access to frequency spaces and outreach for getting new people involved, licensed to the youth, getting them in, engaged in ham radio. And then there's RACES, which that's uh, on more of a government affiliated uh, disaster preparedness. So I think it's FEMA or DHS, but their kind of charters the same is that when there is a situation, some kind of disaster, they can bring in amateurs that have, um, they take the, home, they take the uh, FEMA classes They've got to go through a whole bunch of them as a requirement. And then you could be brought into a situation where ham radio comms are going to be needed or comms where you have to interoperate with some kind of incidence commander or whomever it is mm. for a disaster situation. That's really cool. That's yeah. really interesting. And then, and then you you told me that there was a channel. I, I We find this in preparedness as like somebody who trains preparedness. You, you have a responsibility to your fellow man or woman, your, your community, your family and your friends. And one of the things you kept mentioning was you could transpond, or not transpond, but you could open up a channel mm -hmm. to be able to receive information because on, I forgot the thing, what's it? Uh, the 146.520. Simplex frequency, yeah, national simplex. call simplex frequency. Yeah, why, why is that important to monitors? It, it could have been any frequency, but that just was the one that we picked, uh, amateurs in general. And what it is, is the frequency that anyone can hop onto to make a call. Mm -hmm. That call could be like, hey, I just wanna see who's out there. I am uh, bored, um, doing a radio test. Mm -hmm. Somebody could come back to you. If you are in dire straits and need help, you would hop on that frequency and say, hey, you know, I'm stranded. I need somebody to come get me. I have no cell phone. Um, help. Right? And that's universal for ham yeah. radio operators. They know on that freak, that's the one they're going to be transponding on. Right. It's like the SOS. If it, if it had to be an SOS call, that's the frequency you're going to transpond. Right. So two meters has its own simplex. Uh, 70 centimeters has its own simplex as well. So th there are frequency, single frequencies allocated for those bands for emergency contacts. Wow. That's super impressive. I never, when he said that immediately, because uh, we we went through a, a truck setup with me, mm -hmm. it's at Summit Off Road right now, and I'm getting um, a dual band uh, ham radio, yes. 50 watts, yes. installed in the truck. And when he's driving around, he just turns on that frequency, and he's listening to traffic passively, just in case somebody might transpond it for comms or right. for an emergency. The, the advantage of the radio that you're getting, and most radios will do this, it's a two channel system. So you could leave the calling frequency on your bottom channel to just monitor in case somebody needs help. And then you can have your active repeater or whatever it is you're working with friends on the other channel. So you don't take anything away. It's just sitting there doing its own thing. If somebody needs help, they can call out and you can respond if you need to. That's amazing, man. Yeah. For, for the sum up with uh, survival preparedness as it relates to ham radio, mm -hmm. what, what would be your summary on, on what you should do? Um, I think you need to have a goal. You gotta have a goal on what you're trying to achieve. And then start to make slow progress, right? You don't need to do everything in one day. Start to make slow progress towards that goal. I generally, like I pointed you to, was the Baofeng UV5R because the barrier to entry is so low, right? 25, 25 bucks. bucks. 25 yeah. bucks. Jinx. But <laughs> in reality, it's, it's, it's not just $25, right? I generally tell people, go get the programming cable for this thing program the radio, learn how the radio works, function with the radio so that if you ever needed it, you can use it. There's nothing worse than buying something and go like, well, I'm prepared, and then you, you sit it on the shelf and you never go back to it. You, you gotta practice it, just like you drill with your firearms, just like you would practice with first aid, whatever it is, it, it needs to become a part of your system. If you're not that much in love with, with radio, okay, 
but you still want it in case of emergency, you gotta dust it off occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, for those that do find this interesting, I would recommend you check out Aries or Races, possibly get on the CERT team for your local communities if you have access to that, and then see how you can weave this into your system, however it is. I know Races does, uh, they work with uh, foot races, right? So they'll set up radio operators at different locations and then they can relay where everybody's at and keep track of it. Mm -hmm. That's a practical, kind of test or, or exercise for getting better at doing this. So make sure you have a goal, um, set a budget. The wives love that when you set a budget, mm -hmm. you know, and you keep it within the yep. spaces and then kind of work for work towards your end goal and then just keep practicing. I love that uh, ideology because, you know, this is similar to any piece of preparedness equipment. It could be a pistol, which is your everyday carry, a concealed carry pistol. It could be a tourniquet. If you take it and you put it in your EDC bag and you don't train it, you're gonna lose because it's a perishable skill set. And when you need it the most yep. under a stressful condition or situation, you're probably not going to be efficient and effective at it. And what I like about the idea is this is an investment in preparedness. It's an investment in uh, the long-term uh, thought process of, hey, I'm planning for the worst case scenario, but it also can be something fun. I mean, I'm, I'm geeking out over this stuff inside. I'm just losing it because I'm super excited about this. In fact, so excited I spent a lot of money <laughs> on a radio. Um, what's the radio that you just pointed me to? And then what's the capability difference over this and, and how much do they run? Okay, so this is the FT2DR. Mm -hmm. I just showed you the FT3DR. FT3DR, I'll put which that is in the, the thing. Which is the upgrade to this model. Yep. What's cool about uh, anybody who has one of those if they upgrade to the three, all the accessories are the same. Awesome. The company was super smart and they said, oh, you've got a battery for that, it works with it. Everything mm -hmm. works. If you bought a bunch of accessories, it works, which is very smart. They don't yeah. normally do that. Is it a Korean company? Japanese. Oh, close enough. Korean <laughs> companies are typically the smartest. <laughs>
if you guys are interested, because Philcraft as a company, all the guys, I bought all the guys this, so I have to make them get their ham radio license now. <laughs> uh, but they're doing this, which is the Bofang UV5R. And then uh, in addition to that, we, uh, I just bought this. When, we, when they get uh, licensed, I will get them these radios as well. But I, you will follow me through the journey in this as well. And then we'll cross talk and pollinate with Josh. Um, I'm trying to, I haven't told you this, but I'd like to get you out to the Overland Expo in oh. May. Uh, we have a booth at Overland Expo in May. What, what days is it? Ooh, it's uh, three quarters in. It's like May 17, 18, 19. That might be tough. Really? Ham, Hamvention is this. Oh, thing. the Hamvention supersedes Overland Expo. That's okay. We'll get them How back. How many people go to the Overland Expo? Uh, two. It's a lot. 10,000 plus? Yeah, Hamvention's 35,000 people. Where's that at? Dayton, Ohio. Actually, it's in Xenia, but that's what people know it as. Phil Craft will be going to Hamvention <laughs> 2021. Um, no, but I'm excited about the cross pollination, and I want to say thank you so much for yeah. uh, sharing your knowledge. It's very hard to find real subject matter experts. We are not experts at anything. We actually suck at a lot of things. So when we have something such so important like communication, uh, we don't want to half-ass that. If you're looking at like you know defense tactics that kind of stuff we got it but this kind of thing just like you know i was telling josh in our in my special forces days me and kevin had 18 echoes that weren't very well weren't very good they weren't weren't the best guys because they wanted to shoot guns and we take them <laughs> off the guns and we take the take their guns and shoot but we wanted experts to focus on that skill set but this is something that you as a civilian military law enforcement could get into um, and it's not that difficult. I, I'm very satisfied because I was super overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And after talking to you, yeah. I've realized it's not that bad. It's like a staircase, right? Mm. This is your, here's your first stair, right? And then maybe splash in some solar to keep it all moving along. Yeah. And then you can just, everything is like a different step on the staircase. And then you get over here where you're doing long distance comms. But yeah. th that's not necessarily needed immediately for survival or emergency. We'll get comms. there soon. Yeah. I'm ready to spiral to the top. We're gonna have like this whole entire place as a base station relay you, for- You've got summits area. all around you. I you know. gotta be doing the hikes to the summit and make those contacts with this kind of radio. I mean, you could do it with these too, but yeah. It, I'm excited. This is the right spot. Prescott's awesome for that. What is your, uh, your channels and your social media where people can see what you have going on mm -hmm. and tie into your content. So I'm a ham radio crash course on YouTube, on uh, the Facebook page, the Facebook group, which we created to kind of answer these questions. I was just getting inundated with messages on, you know, what do I do? What radio should I buy? So we made the Facebook group and it, it took off. Uh, not everybody likes Facebook, so we made a Discord. And the Discord is, you know, it's a, it's tilts younger, so a bit younger group of people, but that's amazing fun. That's a chat room and a voice chat. And if you want links to Facebook or Discord, it's on any one of my videos. Just go in the description for that. Check it out there. On Twitter and Instagram, I am Hoshnasi, which is Hotel Oscar Sierra Hotel Nevada, Nevada Alpha Sierra India. And uh, that's where I just do kind of my fun daily stuff. Um, doing a bit of what we're doing here today on there. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Josh. I Absolutely, it, yeah. Thank you, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, if you guys yeah. like the content you just heard, um, and if you didn't like it, just go away, unsubscribe. <laughs> I figured if you're staying here and you tuned in for that long, you like it, make sure you subscribe because 70% of the people who watch our videos aren't subscribed, and it just helps us analytic-wise and allows us to get out there with more reach. Big shout out to Josh. I appreciate him coming in. And if you guys are interested, I'll plug all the stuff at the bottom in the notes page uh, right below me running my mouth. I appreciate you guys. Until next time, stay alert, stay alive.